Mark Wallace sat at his warehouse desk, thinking about what he needed to do with his wife, Willa. He had evidence in front of him about her affair with her boss, Dale Timmons, the proprietor of Timmons Electronics. Timmons Electronics manufactured small electronic controllers that enabled computers to operate mechanical devices. Some were small, while others were rather huge, depending on the application. Mark had been working at Timmons Electronics when he met Willa Miller, whom he successfully wooed and won over for marriage. After a few years, Mark recognized the need for independent warehouses, both dry and refrigerated. So he gambled and went out on his own. Willa was not pleased about the gamble, but she assisted by saving money wherever she could. Now Mark was a 35-year-old wealthy businessman with four massive warehouses and another 100 acres of land for growth on the outskirts of their medium-sized city. A major box shop needed a new distribution center, and Mark's company was top of the list to deliver the structure on a long-term lease. His refrigerated warehouse was large enough to accommodate 30 semi-trucks and flash freeze meat from the local packing plant without the need to unload. This saved a lot of man hours because trucks had to be unloaded to freeze fresh meat and then reloaded for delivery to distant markets. Mark and Willow worked together to get the business off the ground, even on mac and cheese nights when they couldn't afford hot dogs. They kept the wolves away as they worked hard to finish the first warehouse and rent it out. Willa was Dale Timmons' personal assistant. Her appearance was average, standing five feet seven inches tall and weighing approximately 130 pounds. She was a natural brunette who occasionally had highlights in her gorgeous shoulder-length hair. Her legs were long and thin, and her buttocks were just perfect. They had taken the decision to launch the firm before having children, and Mark was now prepared. However, Willa had been less than enthused when they previously discussed progeny. She had a lot on her plate as Timmons Electronics' second-in-command. Mark knew that, while the corporation had a handful of vice presidents, Willa was the one who was expected to get everything done on schedule. Mark had questioned why Willa changed her mind about having children so early in their marriage. They had talked about how many children Mark wanted, their genders, and even the names Rachel, Mike, and Amy. But Willa refused to talk about them anymore. Their sex life was also altering. Mark realized that frequency could diminish as a person aged, but he assumed that his libido would decline while Willis's would increase and peak around the age of 36. No Mark's desire and need to enjoy the physical element of their relationship was as strong as when they first met but he couldn't recall the last time Willa had been hot to trot. She did not want foreplay or even a kiss. She wanted it to be done quickly so she could go to sleep. Of course, this only happened a few times, until Mark abruptly stopped asking for sex. This led Mark to believe that Willa was no longer interested in him. With each passing day, the gulf between them grew greater. There was little communication during dinner while watching The Idiot Box, and there was never any pillow talk after bedtime. Willa didn't appear to care about the business's performance as long as there was money in the bank. The warehouse firm was a separate entity, entirely owned by the Wallaces, with its own checking and savings accounts. Mark drew a fixed sum each payday as their earnings. This preserved profits where they could do the most good, developing the firm. Willa established a separate bank account a few years ago into which her wages were deposited. Willa did make sure to cover a significant portion of the monthly bills, while Mark handled the rest. Willa paid for her own wardrobe and sundries, including spa and hairdressing appointments. Mark decided to use the company account to hire a private investigator to dig into Willa and her boss, Dale Timmons. Willa never looked at those accounts, and to be honest, none of the records were stored at the house any longer, as Mark had a whole set of corporate offices in one of the warehouses. She would not casually observe anything about the investigation. Mark had known Dale for many years, first as a Timmons Electronics employee and later as a Timmons vendor. Dale utilized one of Mark's warehouses, or at least a portion of one, to store controllers before shipping. Thus, they retained official relations. Mark also attended every outing organized by Timmons Electronics for its employees. There was a scheduled spring picnic, a 4th of July celebration with fireworks, and an early October picnic for the final few sunny days before the snowfall. Then there came the holiday party in December. Dale also attempted to organize a one-box pheasant hunt in November, 
which was largely attended by male employees and male couples, but a few women were also avid bird hunters and would participate. Willow was not a hunter, thus she skipped on the event. I just planned it together with the rest of the company's activities. Mark had never gotten the impression that Willow was engaged with Dale, but he was the most plausible suspect because they spent so much time working together. Willa even accompanied Dale on sales trips and at conventions. Of course, they had separate rooms, but Mark had never attempted to call Willis's room during a trip because she always carried her cell phone, which had good reception wherever they went. Willa had always answered the phone on the first or second ring, and she had never appeared out of breath or distracted when speaking with Mark. On rare occasions, she missed a phone call. She would call back as soon as possible. She would occasionally return calls late at night, citing a work supper or a meeting with potential clients. She never missed a call back by waiting until the next day, as so many cheating wife stories have the errant husband do. Mark was wary of Willis's changing opinions toward children and her isolation in their personal lives. At 35 years old, Mark was also feeling the biological clock ticking, not so much about if he could father a child or two, but more realistically about whether he wanted to be the age of most grandfathers when his children from high school. Waiting even a few years would make it more difficult to get down on the floor and play with his children. Unfortunately, he knew that if Willa was no longer in love with him or had decided not to have children, his chances of becoming a parent were also jeopardized, as he believed it would take a long time to develop a new connection. Dale Timmons was married. Gretchen, his wife, was a good woman who had given birth to three children for him. But she had indulged a little too much. No, she was not fat. But she did have a lot of baby weight that she didn't seem to want or need to lose. Mark could easily understand why Dale could be drawn to his somewhat younger and still in good shape. Personal assistant Mark used a private security firm that advertised itself as a full-service security organization. They performed cybersecurity, background checks, and then site security to ensure that firms were completely protected. He called the owner, Chris Couples. An appointment was established, and Mark completed his present project before proceeding to the Security One offices. Chris greeted him and served him a cup of coffee. Chris began the chat when they had made themselves comfortable. So Mark, what brought you to my office today? Usually you just phone if there's an issue with one of my employees. Have you been hacked somehow? Mark delivered a cynical chuckle. Maybe I've been violated. He raised his hand. No, not those warehouses. They're all perfectly fine. Our PCs and network are secure as far as I can tell. He paused, letting out a heavy sigh. No, this is Willa, my wife. We're becoming more and more like strangers. Our sex life is a disaster. I desire children, and she refuses to even explore the notion. I don't have any proof, but I'm wondering if she's not with someone else. And right now, all I'm doing is providing a place to live. Chris took it all seriously. When a long-married person began to suspect a dalliance, there was usually fire at the root of the smoke being detected. Of course, Mark could be incorrect, and Willa is innocent. However, history suggests otherwise. Any probe would have to be extremely quiet so as not to upset Willa, and maybe jeopardize her marriage to Mark. I have a few good investigators. Actually, the finest one is a lady who excels at her job. I believe she lives for catching errant spouses. Actually, she excels at any type of investigation. Her background checks are more rigorous than others and she specializes in the recovery of insured stolen goods. Mark nodded. She, whoever she was, was probably the finest person to handle this. Chris went on. Who do you believe Willa is engaged with? There have been no overt hints, but her boss, Dale Timmons of Timmons Electronics, is the most likely suspect. Chris should have predicted because he knew where Willa worked. There may be a little conflict of interest. Timmons benefits from our patrol and security services. Dale Timmons has never been particularly concerned about most other sorts of security, so we simply drive past and check the doors at night. He sat and thought about his condition for a few moments before making a phone call. Lisa, is Tom here right now? There was a pause. Hello, Tom. This is Christopher Couples. I've got a brief question for you. Is there a conflict of interest? What if one of my clients requests me to do an investigation? Personal, of course, about another of my clients. There is no examination into the businesses themselves, only officials from the two firms. There was another pause. 
Okay, yes, I see. Thank you for this information. Chris hangs up the phone. That was my lawyer. He claims that there could be a conflict of interest, but since the corporations engaged our services rather than the principals, there should be no worry. I hope you weren't intending to pay me using the corporation's checking account. Mark appeared slightly chastised. I had pondered doing that so Willow wouldn't see the bill. I will simply use some money for your price and have no formal connection to the company. If necessary, I can transfer money to myself in order to refund my savings account. Mark was reassured after the probe had initiated. Whatever he discovered would provide information about his wife and marriage, as well as the destiny of any progeny. Mark did not immediately consult a divorce attorney, nor did he go to all of the area good attorneys and request a consultation appointment so that Willa could not get a shark. Should divorce be considered in the future, he did not instantly raid their joint accounts and transfer money. He did not have his accountant transfer money to the Cayman Islands. Nope, he did nothing but go back to work. Life continued as before. The Wallaces coexisted as they had for several months. Mark and Willa shared a bed but rarely engaged in any type of sexual activity. They still didn't say much and Mark never brought up the subject of children. He just sort of retreated within himself and began to evaluate his future. A future without Willa. Chris supplied updates, but his investigator went undercover so there was no news for a while. Chris informed Mark about his best private investigator, was now working at Timmons Electronics, looking into Willa's working relationship with her boss, Dale, as well as any strange business practices. Mark recognized the importance of cautious and methodical investigations, but was concerned about what might be discovered. After many months, Mark finally received a report. He and Chris sat down and reviewed the full packet of paperwork. It seemed perfect. There were transcripts of emails, text messages, and phone calls. There were also videos from other out-of-town meetings. Willa and her employer were undeniably romantic. Some of the transcripts were even more disappointing, with Willa making numerous negative statements about Mark and his abilities as a lover. Chris quickly pointed out that cheaters frequently trash-speak their spouses during sex to make themselves feel less guilty. Dale made numerous comments to his own wife's frigidity, as if this would make Mark feel better. Mark is now dealing with doubts regarding his wife and, to some extent, his business. Willa was a co-owner, and it might break him to buy out her stake. The local economy was strong, thus the business was worth a lot. It was beneficial for business, but extremely detrimental in the event of divorce. He had to start planning what he was going to do. Should he confront Willa and insist that she return and be true solely to him? Should he simply move out and live separately from Willa? Should he toss her out and face the repercussions which could include selling the business? Should he just ignore everything and hope it blows over someday? He also had to decide whether to tell Gretchen Timmons what he'd discovered. What if she divorces Dale? Would he then apply full court pressure on Willa to dump Mark? So many questions, so few clear solutions. Mark developed a horrible headache, nausea, and the want to locate a quiet, dark room just thinking about it. Willa had observed Mark seemed distant than normal, and now she was concerned due to a nasty headache. She spent a rare evening attempting to make her husband feel better. She prepared him some soup, and surprise, surprise, it wasn't straight from a can. While he was sleeping, she kept the TV on low volume. She checked in on him at regular intervals to see how he was feeling. Mark liked the gestures, particularly the soup, but wondered why. Willa was finally feeling something for him. As his headache subsided, he began to plan even outlandish things, and crazy goals and ambitions were healthier than wallowing in despair over his failed marriage. He emerged from the illness with a renewed resolve. He fell asleep while hammering out the details of his plan to expose his wife and her boyfriend to the neighborhood. He refused to inform Gretchen she could find out, when everyone else discovered Willa and Dale's secret life. The next morning he awoke and smiled at the sight of his wife in the bed next to him. He got up, shaved, had a long hot shower, and then dressed. Willa was just awakening when he decided to leave the bedroom and have some breakfast. Rise and shine, my dear. Thank you for everything last night. I feel fantastic. I'm not sure why I had such a bad headache, but it's gone now, and I'm ready to get on with the rest of my life thanks to you. 
He bent and kissed her on the cheek as she was still attempting to wake up, and now her husband was cheery and full of life, whereas previously he had been so down and miserable that he would seldom attempt to communicate to her. She quickly showered and dressed, then joined him for a cup of coffee. Her breakfast was normally taken in Dale's office. Sometimes they had anything to eat. Mark sat down and informed her that he was going forward with the new warehouse. The large box corporation refused to commit to the distribution center, therefore the plans had been put on hold. Mark rationalized his action by explaining to Willa that all of their current warehouses were once risky, but are now profitable. A large unoccupied building may not deter the big box corporation, but it may entice other enterprises searching for the same thing, affordable premises in good locations, with access to interstates and rail to east shipping. Willa finally had to let Mark carry out his plan because he had been correct in every previous business decision thus far. Wallace Warehouses was about to grow again. Mark also needed the construction to begin since it may help his idea operate better. He proceeded to the office, called in his right-hand person, Kelly Parsons, and got her started on the construction. He immediately contacted his solicitor and proceeded to revise his will. While in the attorney's office, he updated his succession plan for the corporation in case he was unable to run it for any reason. Mark's attorney had been hounding him to do so for months, so his idea was not surprising. Willa would remain the majority stockholder if Mark died or became incompetent. She would not, however, have any say in how the business was run. She would benefit from any profits made, but Kelly would become CEO and just have to report to Willa on how the business was performing. Willa's monetary withdrawals would be controlled, preventing her from raiding the earnings and forcing the company to shut down. She could sell the company, but not destroy it. Now came the rest of the plan. Mark gradually withdrew money from the company's coffers, a few hundred here and there. Over the next few weeks, he saved around $10,000 for his planned disappearance. He wouldn't be gone long, maybe a week or two. But by the time he returned, the damage should have been done. He went to a veterinary supply store and bought a few needles for syringes. He didn't require the syringes, so no questions were raised. He also went inside the store dressed like a typical cattle producer, which helped him get what he wanted. He then conducted extensive online searches for what he needed to know, but went to the public library to ensure that any probe into his personal and company computers did not expose his interest in the specific subjects. At home, he smiled and spoke with Willa. She replied, even initiating a sexual encounter or two. It was bittersweet to realize how late in the game she remembered who her spouse was. During the first session, he considered abstaining from sex with Willa, but determined that he had no indication of an STD and had no idea when he would have sexual relief again. So he might as well enjoy these brief interludes while he can. Mark and Willa also attended Timmins Electronics Spring Celebration. Employees and their families were treated to a catered buffet, as well as games for adults and children. Prizes were awarded to adult winners. Each child received a small item for attending and participating in the program. Mark took sure not to drink too much because he wasn't sure he'd be able to avoid a fight with his opponent, Dale. He avoided having any genuine conversation with the man, but he did sit and chat with Gretchen for a time before joining other little groups of conversationalists. It was a pleasant evening, despite the fact that Willa briefly disappeared with Dale. Needless to say, Willa did not initiate sex with Mark once they came home. Mark did not press the subject. The new warehouse's construction was currently in its early stages, to prepare the location for the massive concrete pad that would form the floor. It was time to begin the strategy. Mark stayed late in his office one evening with the needle from the veterinary supply store. Mark set out to draw some of his own blood. He had considered being able to do this, but reasoned that narcotics enter their own veins. All the time, so he could too. Mark applied the improvised tourniquet based on the information he had obtained from the internet. After swabbing the area with an alcohol swab, the vein in his elbow rose up nicely, making an excellent target. After taking a big breath and holding it, he made the first stab. Thankfully, he must have done something correctly, because there was blood streaming out of the needle into the clear tubing he had acquired at a hardware shop and into the plastic bag. He knew he should only take roughly a pint of blood at a time to avoid becoming too weak, 
so he carefully monitored the flow. When the bag was filled, he used locking pliers to crimp the tubing and release the tourniquet. The needle was subsequently removed, and he applied direct pressure for the specified five minutes. He was relieved to see that there was no bruising around the minor remaining wound. He reasoned that if he could get away without applying a bandage when he arrived home, Willow would not notice the injury. He now had some blood to support his plan. He considered using blood from a fresh cow or pig, but DNA testing by any credible laboratory would quickly reveal what he did. No, the idea required human blood, specifically his blood, to keep the blood from clotting in the bag. He'd read that an anticoagulant was necessary. He was concerned about acquiring it until he learned that rat poison is largely an anticoagulant. He then purchased a box of rat and mouse poison to put in the back. He wasn't sure how much to put in, so it was a trial and error process. He then placed the bag containing his own blood in the tiny fridge in his office. It had a key lock to ensure that no one else looked inside. He cleaned the needle in the tube and hung it to dry. He would need another pint or so of blood to complete his plan, but he needed to heal first. Later that evening, he put the next part of his plan into action. First, he went online and created a profile under Willis's name, then used her email address to take up a new $1 million life insurance policy on his own life rather than Willis's. He then began calling members of his and Willis's families, as well as all of their acquaintances and some of Willis's co-workers, because he did not have phone numbers for everyone. He placed a call to Dale Timmons. Say, Dale, this is Mark Wallace. Could you do me a favor? Willis's birthday is in approximately three weeks on the 18th, and I'm preparing a surprise party at our house. Could you tell all of your staff about the party? Dale was supportive. Hell yeah, I will. Willa is a crucial component of my team and a wonderful person. Furthermore, I am sure many of my staff would be delighted to come and surprise her. Can I help in another way? Because Mark wasn't supposed to know about his wife's extracurricular activities, he played the clueless cock. Yes, Dale, would you keep Willa late that evening and bring her home at 7 o'clock? That would give everyone else an opportunity to enter the house and hide. Dale was plainly eager to keep Willa occupied. After he hung up, Mark was confident that Willa would return home on her birthday. In the coming days, Mark planned a wonderful birthday gift and a large cake. He also hired a caterer to provide meals for the celebration. The caterer would arrive and set up around the same time as the first guest. The building contractors were preparing to sink footings for the new huge warehouse when Mark decided to donate another pint of blood in order to complete his idea. He secured the tourniquet and then inserted the needle into the healing portion of his arm, obtaining another pint. This time, he carefully deposited the used needle and tubing in a dumpster behind the medical clinic. He assumed no one would look twice at it. That night, he waited until Willa was asleep before bringing the rat poison jar into the bedroom using gloves. He had carefully cleaned it down after putting on the gloves. He then used Willis's hands to hold the container leaving many fingerprints on it. He then returned the container to the safe cabinet in the garage. The surprise party day arrived. Mark had arranged for a member of the Willis family to arrive a bit early, as he had made an explanation for being late. Mark did not go to work that day. He simply drove around the corner and parked till Willa departed. He returned to the house. Mark pulled on his raincoat and lay down on the bed, he dumped most of the two quarts of blood upon the suit, allowing it to flow off and soak into the bedding. Any police officer would infer that there had been a significant blood loss because ordinary clothes absorbs a lot of blood. He expected the CSI team to conclude that he had lost the majority of his blood. He then got up, didn't bother to block blood from pouring down his rain suit, and used the shower to clean up the majority of the remnants. Then it was straight to the kitchen. He dipped the knife from Willis's favorite cutlery set in the blood, cleaned it, and returned it to the block. He expected an investigator to look for little amounts of blood remnants. He also took out a glass, put a drink of vodka into it, and poisoned it with rat poison. He then emptied the drink down the kitchen drain, cleaned the glass, and placed it in the dishwasher. Mark then took out a sheet of plastic and placed a number of tools and other heavy stuff on it, then put some of the blood at the end of the plastic and then rolled it up and hauled it out of the bedroom down the hall and into the garage. Then he noticed that Dale was always parked outside the spot. 
The ground was covered in scrape marks and the occasional drop of blood. Mark then returned to the house and placed a letter he had printed out on the table for everyone to see, which read, Willa, I was summoned away for emergency business. Please enjoy your birthday without me, and I'll help you celebrate when I return in a week or two. Mark did not sign it. He then placed the envelope containing the documentation of the Dale and Willis affair in the top drawer of his desk for the police to find. Mark noted that some of the leftover blood on his ring gear had dropped on the floor, but he ignored it and removed the gear, placing it all in a garbage bag. He left the lights on, made sure not to bring anything that would ordinarily be taken on a trip, and then took the trash bag and buried it in a dumpster behind a local bottle shop. He returned to the house and hid outside, waiting for his wife and her lover to arrive. Willis's cousin came on time, and the caterer just happened to show there at the same moment. They all headed indoors. Some of the other visitors came within a few minutes and stepped inside. Mark was disappointed. It seemed to take a long time before someone became concerned about the blood on the floor of the house. Then things began to happen. A police cruiser sped up the street and stopped outside the Wallace home. Mark kept to his hiding place. More guests arrived, as did more cops. At 7 p.m., Dale and Willa came, and Dale scooped up the vast number of police cruisers, friends and family vehicles, and even an ambulance that were preventing the cheating duo from parking near the house. They exited the pickup truck and approached the gathering. Mark used the chance to creep down the street, approach Daly's truck from behind, and then drip a few drops of blood into the box. He also placed a blood-splattered roll of duct tape and a little portion of plastic sheet in the back of the box. Then Mark went away, aware that he had caused some disturbance. A few blocks away, he flagged down a cab and had it transport him to his new warehouse location. He strolled into the new location after leaving the cab far away. The footings had all been poured but were still being set up. He spilled a few more blood samples onto the ground in the forms. He then walked away, heading to a tiny hotel. He had to walk roughly two kilometers, but he didn't want any additional trails leading to him. He paid cash for the accommodation. His objective was to disappear for approximately a week before reappearing hale and healthy. He was banking that gossip or the police or both would track down Willa and Dale, exposing their affair to the public. Mark slept soundly that night. The next day, he went out and bought an electronic tablet with cash, then returned to the hotel and connected it to the hotel's public Wi-Fi. He quickly entered into a social media site and began contacting some of the party guests. One was Willis's cousin, who was a notorious gossip, and the main reason Mark invited her to the party early. Her post read as follows, I could not believe it. I arrived at the same time as the caterer, and we proceeded into the kitchen so he and his team could set up. We didn't see anything until one of the men slipped on a bloody spot on the floor. By that time, others had arrived, and I was assisting them in getting beverages in the living room. The caterer followed the blood spots out to the driveway, where they vanished abruptly. He then returned and grabbed me, and we proceeded into the bedroom. When we opened the door, I nearly passed out. There was a lot of blood on the bed. It seemed like someone had killed a pig or something. We locked the door and phoned the cops. More and more people arrived. After the first cop arrived, he ordered everyone to leave the house, except for those of us who came in and discovered the blood. More cops arrived, brought the gathering outside, and began questioning them. When they learned that it was in Willis's honor, they then started asking where she was. At seven, she approached the crowd and inquired as to what was going on. She was smiling, so I assume she thought it was her birthday celebration. I'm not sure what everyone outside knew, but I'm guessing the supposition was driving the debate. The cops immediately apprehended her and her boss and led them into cars. And I suppose it's off to the police station for interrogation. We all knew it then. Mark was missing. The bed was bloodied, as if someone had attacked him while he was sleeping, and then disposed of the body without having time to return and clean up. I hate to say it, but Willa was unaware of the party. Thus it appears like she did something to Mark but was unable to complete the task. Mark had removed the batteries from his cell phone so it could not be linked to him. He listened to a local talk radio station's hourly newscast. He watched the news around midday. They reported the missing businessman's narrative, as well as the fact that Willa and Dale were potential suspects. The police held a news conference and said that the investigation had just begun. 
and if anyone has any information about Mark Wallace, please contact the police immediately. Mark realized he had not expected to see his photo on television and in the papers. He couldn't go out until he was disguised. He chose to stop shaving. He had always kept himself clean-shaven and even went fishing, so this was not expected. He expected the police would create a profile of him to facilitate their search. He also instructed himself to avoid any of his usual destinations while gone. His appearance was unassuming enough that he believed he could go to a local fast food establishment and order food. After eating, he decided to take a bus to a nearby community situated on a popular fishing lake. It would offer him something to do except sit and stew in a motel. First, he went to a nearby second-hand clothes store and located some togs that would be appropriate for fishing, but did not appear to be new. After settling into a little cabin, he spent the day sitting on the shore, casting his inexpensive rod and reel and trying not to catch anything. He spoke with other anglers. They all had a great story about the one that got away. Mark made up his own Whopper story to share with them. Every evening he would read the local newspaper and the news. There wasn't much because cops are generally quiet during investigations. However, the pundits told a different story. They were outspoken in their criticism of Willa and Dale. The media had somehow discovered, or at least detected, the affair and were embellishing the narrative with supposition that the typical person was taking his word for it. Mark examined the social networking site, and Willis's cousin had posted more opinions. She revealed that Willis's parents had received death threats over Mark's disappearance. Mark felt sorry for them, since they had always welcomed him and made him feel like a member of the family. Mark's parents had passed away some years before the dreaded C word. He still got chills and almost wept when he learned someone was diagnosed with cancer. He was also unable to pronounce the word. He always referred to it as C. He had a morbid thought. Perhaps Willa would develop cancer and Dale would catch it. Yes, he knew that cancer is not communicable, but his mind, the tiny portion that desired Willa's pain, had its own petty thoughts and fantasies. He genuinely did not want her to die, simply suffer a little. Thinking about collateral damage after the fact made him unhappy because he had not anticipated that Willis's parents and other family members would be impacted by his actions. After being gone for a week and a half, Mark happened to see a press conference from his hometown. He didn't know the complete story, but it appeared like Willa and Dale had been indicted for murder. Based on it, he searched his tablet for anything related to Willa Wallace's name. He discovered a few of items on the internet for his hometown newspaper. Mark grinned upon reading the article. He had forgotten that the local district attorney was running for re-election, and his opponent was extremely popular. It was rare for a prosecutor to go public so early in an investigation, but any trial would come after the election. So the district attorney was trying to boost his poll numbers by taking credit for apprehending Mark's attackers. Now, as the trial would take place after the election. The study cited the DA extensively. Two weeks ago, Mark Wallace, the proprietor of Wallace Warehouses, went missing from his home. When family and friends arrived at the residence, they discovered blood on the floor and markings on the floor indicating that something heavy had been pulled outside and apparently loaded in a vehicle, possibly a pickup, before leaving the scene. Further examination revealed a blood-stained mattress in Wallace's master bedroom, as well as blood on the floor and in the bathroom. We also learned that someone had taken a shower before the action was interrupted, most likely by relatives and friends arriving for Mrs. Wallace's surprise birthday party. The blood deposit in the drain matched the blood on the bed. DNA testing revealed that the blood was from Mark Wallace due to the significant amount of blood saturated the bed. The coroner believes Mr. Wallace was killed in his bed and then relocated. Further investigation revealed that a significant level of the anticoagulant warfarin, the active ingredient in rat poison, was detected in the blood. In the residence, crime scene investigators discovered a jar of rat poison with Mrs. Wallace's fingerprints on it. Mrs. Wallace has denied knowing about or handling the rat poison. There were no other fingerprints located on the container. We also found a glass in the dishwasher that had not yet been washed. The glass had rat poison traces. The only fingerprints on the glass belonged to Mark Wallace. We also discovered a knife in the cutlery block with blood traces on it. That blood also matches Mr. Wallace's DNA, and a note to Mrs. Wallace was discovered on the kitchen table, reportedly from Mr. Wallace, who apologized for having to be out of town to meet with a customer. 
It was not signed and was printed using a home computer and printer. We found no sign that Mr. Wallace had taken any clothing or toiletries with him when he left for a visit. His car was in the garage. We questioned his business associate, Kelly Parsons, and she confirmed that Mr. Wallace was not scheduled to meet a client at this time. He has not returned phone messages, and we were unable to locate his cell phone while tracking it. It has either had its battery removed, is completely flat, or has been buried so deeply that no signal can be received. It is assumed that Mr. Wallace met a tragic end. The search for his body continues. As for a motivation, Mr. Wallace discovered proof that Mrs. Wallace and her boss, Dale Timmons, owner of Timmons Electronics Manufacturing Company, were having an affair. Furthermore, an independent investigation report was made available to our office, indicating that Timmons Electronics is in financial distress and requires a capital infusion. Mrs. Wallace's email trail reveals that Mr. Wallace has a new $1 million life insurance policy. A blood trace was discovered in Mr. Timmons' pickup truck, which was parked at the Wallace's residence on the night of a surprise party. Police discovered a roll of duct tape and some plastic in the truck, both covered in Mr. Wallace's blood. As a result, despite the fact that no body has been found, I am requesting a grand jury indictment for capital murder. This is an unusual request, but our office believes that the two people with the most to gain from murder may attempt to exit the nation because they travel regularly and have active passports. Mark had a really delighted expression on his face after completing the piece. One of the paper's columnists provided additional insight on persons who cheat on their spouses and what should be done about it. The only disadvantage Mark could envision was what would happen if he suddenly appeared hale and hearty. Can he be charged with a crime? He'd have to act quickly before the DA ended up looking foolish. Mark boarded the bus and headed for the nearest metropolis of any type. He then went to a neighborhood convenience store, which sold cell phones and charged by the minute. Of course, they'd check for his ID, but he told the cashier he'd misplaced his wallet and mobile phone and needed to call his family to get them replaced and travel home safely. Thankfully, the cashier believed the account. Mark reasoned that being a vacation town, this scenario might occur frequently enough to not raise concern. Mark then called the tip line established by his local police department and introduced himself. The operator took a minute before deciding to believe him. He was put on hold and after a few minutes, a detective answered the phone. This is Mike Rawlins, a police detective. I want you to understand that this chat is being recorded. The call is being tracked according to department protocol. Now, how can I help you? Hello, Detective Rawlins. My name is Mark Wallace. I assume you were looking for me in relation to an incident at my home. I just wanted to inform you and the district attorney that I am well and undamaged. I staged a scenario in which I informed my wife, her lover, and boss as well as our family and friends, about Willie's infidelity. I knew the police would be called, but I didn't expect charges to be filed before I returned to clear things up. Except for Willa and Dale, I had no intention of making anyone feel ashamed. The good detective then conducted rigorous questioning to determine whether this was the actual Mark Wallace and not an imposter. Currently, the poser list stood at 25. A murder case usually drew out the odd and miserable who would do almost everything for their 15 minutes of fame, including risking jail or prison. These miserable people who confessed to crimes consumed much of the police's time, since all leads had to be investigated. Rawlins told Mark this after he was confident he was speaking with the actual Mark Wallace. Mr. Wallace, we need you to enter. We need to talk about this entire show. As soon as I can, I shall notify the DA's office that you are actually alive and healthy. Are you or have you ever been in any danger? Mark shook his head, despite knowing Detective Rawlins couldn't see his movements. No, Detective, I am not in danger and I am not being coerced. I left town a few days after starting the whole thing. I did not include anyone in my plans. This was partly to keep the whole affair a secret until I was ready to pull the gun, so to speak, and also to prevent anyone else from becoming involved, in case I broke a law or two. I have also not consulted an attorney, except to alter my will. Before all of this happened, I wanted to keep my wife from damaging my business by keeping it out of her reach. Mark suspected that Detective Rawlins had notified the local police to his presence in their town, he clearly aware that the 901 system can trace all cell phones. 
He was so strolling down the street, always moving as he spoke. He stepped on a local bus that had stopped at the corner and gave the driver the fare. He didn't particularly care where he headed right now. He could easily return to the bus station and travel back to his leased cabin. As he did so, a police patrol car went by, and he noticed the officer craning his neck to look for someone who matched Mark's description while using a phone device. I am aware that you have tracked this cell phone and that the local police are now looking for me. I will not oppose arrest if they catch up with me, but I have no intention of entering right now. I have informed you that I am not missing or deceased. I know the DA will be embarrassed, but I believe he is smart and astute enough to use this circumstance to his advantage without looking silly. The average citizen will see that he was only following the evidence and has the public's best interests at heart. I'm pulling out the battery right now and will contact you again soon. Before Detective Rollins could say anything, Mark pushed the end button and instantly removed the phone's back and battery. No signal could presently be transmitted. He peeked out the back of the bus as it turned a corner and saw a patrol car drive down the street without following the bus. Mark got off at the next station and asked which bus to take back to the depot. He was soon on his way back to his cabin. After returning to the cabin, Mark took a gamble and reinserted the battery into the phone. He didn't think the cops could follow it because the phone went from city to city between usage. He called his attorney and shortly told him the entire tale of what he had done. His attorney was not pleased. Mark, you could face many criminal charges, beginning with conspiracy. You stated that you were aware that the police would become involved and that you planned for the killer and Dale to face charges. The prosecutor. They might even try to arrest you for filing a fraudulent police complaint. As you expected, the cops would get involved in this. You have now alienated every friend and relative who thinks you were murdered. While it may even come after me because you recently revised your will and the succession plan at your company, how do I establish I had no knowledge of what you were planned and did? The attorney persisted for a while before regaining control. So what do you want to do? Mark knew his old friend would be upset with him, so he didn't try to stop his diatribe or correct him on some wrong assumptions he had. Right now, I believe I require legal representation from the district attorney's office. I am confident that Detective Rawlins will get him engaged right away, before the man can have another press conference regarding the grand jury. He paused and let the attorney to acknowledge it. Then I'd like you, or someone with experience in divorce law, to file for divorce from Willa. I haven't spoken with her or any of our friends or relatives, but I guess she's been shunned since this all happened. This was my expected outcome all along. I wanted her to figuratively wear the scarlet letter and have the entire community against her and that shithead Dale Timmons when the time came, and I'll leave everything up to you. I want Dale to be served with alienation of affection. Papers. I'm not sure if he has a non-fraternization policy, but he has to pay for screwing my wife. Mark paused and reflected while his attorney jotted down some suggestions. I suppose I'll also need someone to fuel the heat for me when I return. I do not think I could face reporters right now. I am sure they would ask some awkward questions. I have no intention of addressing any questions regarding the affair, the party, or how I set everything up. His attorney agreed, and they devised a plan for Mark to stay in contact in case the DA attempted a wiretap on the attorney's phone system. Mark hung up and contacted Kelly Parsons, his chief operating officer, or Cole and Kelly. This is Mark. Kelly instantly hung up. He called again, this time through the switchboard, and after identifying himself, the call was redirected to Kelly's office, but he requested the receptionist to listen in and reconnect him if she hung up again. Kelly waited almost a minute before answering the phone. Mark assumed that the receptionist, a longtime employee, had encouraged Kelly to listen to Mark this time because he was aware of the policies governing phone discussions. This is Kelly Parsons. How may I help you, Kelly? Do not hang up on me again. I'd hate to have to find someone to replace you. This is Mark. How do I know it is you? Mark chuckled. My little experiment in framing someone has gone far too successfully. I understand why you're hesitant. It appears that I died in my bed and someone took my body. I can guarantee you, however, that I am alive and well. Kelly went through the 20-question test to persuade herself that this was her boss and friend. Once she was certain he was alive and talking to her, she had more questions. When are you coming back? I'm presuming you are not currently in the city. Have you contacted Willie yet? Mark became serious. 
Allow me to answer your questions one at a time initially. I am not sure when I will be returning home. My attorney is speaking with the district attorney, since I may have broken a few laws with my stunt. Hopefully they can work out a solution that does not require me to spend time in jail. Second, I have no intention of speaking with my wife in the near future. She has been putting up with that nonsense for far too long. She has only been staying with me to sleep and pay her bills while she continues her relationship with Dale. Kelly gave an unexpected response. I wish you'd talk to her. Yes, I agree that she was being highly disrespectful to you and your marriage, but the notion that you might be dead has shaken her to her core. I won't say she loves you, but she holds you in high esteem. She has been calling us virtually every day. At first, I assumed she was attempting to take over the company, and I was eager to talk with her. When I finally spoke with her, I discovered that her entire family had rejected her for all of her transgressions, including the claim that she had murdered you. She's got no one to talk to. She had been distraught with concern about you when the evidence showed that you knew about her affair. She explained that she could understand how someone might suspect she was involved in your disappearance. In addition, the district attorney. Dale's financial troubles were exposed yesterday. She quickly contacted me about it, wondering whether Dale had you removed and was preparing her for the fall. I suppose I can understand her position. I merely wanted to publicly disgrace her for what she's done to me and the others here. We struggled to get the firm off the ground and lucrative enough to have a family. She recently stopped talking about children. We had chosen names. We acquired the house with the intention of filling the bedrooms with children. We had a plan. She determined on her own that she was more important than us. Some of the comments revealed to me in the transcripts of the recording indicated that she did not love or respect me. I'm wasting my time in this relationship, and I was getting depressed, since I might not be able to be a parent till I meet someone else, and I might be getting too old to appreciate being a father. She needed to pay. He paused to recover his breath and relax. He was getting agitated. I know it wasn't the best idea to bring this up in public, but I was getting frustrated at how she was treating our marriage and the risk of her destroying all we fought for if we divorced. At the very least, this way, I risk losing everything. However, the stigma associated with what she did to us will remain. He paused again. Hell with how the media portrays all of this. She will always be remembered as the woman who may have done something to her husband. The news coverage after I return from the dead will not be as sensational as those when I disappeared. Many people will dismiss the fact that I am still alive and continue to believe she is a murderer, so they switched gears and Kelly updated Mark on the business. The massive warehouse was still under construction. Kelly said nothing about whether the blood spilled at the site drew any attention, except that the police had summoned in some very strong ground radar instruments and examined all of the footings, as well as other construction sites, in search of his body. Cash flow was fine. Willa simply used one account to set up her attorney. There were no further unexpected cash outflows. When Mark believed he had caught up, he promised Kelly he would contact Willa to let her know he was still alive. She gave him an alternative number. Willis's phones, both landline and cell, had been swamped with individuals denouncing or applauding her. Yes, some individuals believe she'd done something good, or the news media is attempting to obtain the inside scoop on everyone else. Willa was also hiding someplace within the city. She had to pledge the day that she would not try to leave town for whatever reason. Dale was also hiding. He was receiving largely death threats. His business was failing. Many of his clients were canceling or putting orders on hold until his personal issues could be resolved. Gretchen filed for divorce right after the initial news story broke. She was evidently fed up with his philandering tendencies and was not going to defend her guy when he was suspected of murdering her lover's husband. She even issued a restraining order against him. Mark was delighted to hear the news. Mark got two charges on his inexpensive cell phone. After a long talk with Kelly, the call to Willa would have to wait until after lunchtime. He left his phone and headed down to the restaurant facing the marina before returning to his cabin. He discovered his phone was fully charged, so he began dialing Willa but stopped. She probably wouldn't answer a call from an unfamiliar number. He pulled out his personal phone, reinserted the battery, and phoned her new number. She'd know who it was based on her caller ID. Willa answered the third ring. She hesitated. 
Mark considered twisting the knife by beginning to talk in a ghostly voice, but decided Willa had suffered enough. Willa. This is Mark. He waited for her reaction. It was really quiet for a long time. Mark eventually ended the silence. Willa, are you there? This is Mark. I'm alive and uninjured. She began to bawl. It wasn't simply crying, it sounded like a full-on meltdown. Mark tried to speak a few times, but it was clear that she was not hearing anything at the moment. He kept his tongue till she began to regain control. Finally, despite her hiccups, slobbering, and scratchy throat from crying, she managed to question Mark. Is this indeed you? You sound like him, as did several of the others. How can I be certain? Mark reminded her of the first time they were trapped in the rain on a date. The deluge began as they were in the thick of a tryst. Of course, they'd never discuss the episode with anyone else. Oh, Mark, it is you. You mentioned that others sounded like me. What happened within the last week? I would receive some phone calls. Some even originated from your cell phone number, and a couple of them emerged from the home. Phone number? I believe a hacker grabbed the numbers. Each time I heard a phantom voice that sounded vaguely like you were accusing me of murder. It was driving me insane. The only reason I answered this time was because Kelly called a few minutes ago and said you were alive and would call me. She gasped and must have put the phone down to blow her nose and dry her eyes before picking it up again, she continued. I was startled when she called with all of the proof. I was beginning to believe you had been murdered and then your corpse concealed. I even accused Dale of this. I only knew one thing. I was innocent. Before Mark could respond, she continued. I'm not sure whether I should be relieved that you're alive or angry at you for what you've done to me and us. I want to hug and shake you simultaneously. If I yell at you, it's because I was worried about you and afraid you died. At the same time, I'd like to understand why you did this. Why, Mark? Have I treated you so badly? Mark felt this conversation was going to go downhill fast. He needed to delve in before he could hang up. Willa, you were screwing your employer, Dale. Second, you would not consider having any children. Third, our sex life took place on the toilet. Fourth, it appears that you are only utilizing our house to sleep and remain out of the weather while continuing your business and affair. You didn't appear to care about anything we ever planned. You wouldn't confide in me anymore. You were solely interested in how the business was doing so you didn't have to worry about money. I bet you even returned to our house that night. Yes, I understand you granted him complete access to your body. She started to object, but Mark hung up and turned the phone off. He then removed the battery again and placed the phone in his duffel bag. Mark was now fatigued. His bones ached. He supposed he had been tense all day. First, travel to the city. Then the call to Detective Rollins. After then, there's the cat and mouse game with the local cops, followed by the return trip here. The phone calls he received after returning to his cabin effectively ended his entire day. He decided to take a nap. When he awoke, it was dark. He walked to the restaurant and ate a small supper. As he ate, he considered what he should do in the near future. He was becoming bored here. Fishing was fine for a short while, but he couldn't stay here forever. It was time to move on. After walking back to the cabin, he turned on the television. He had never watched much television, although he did appreciate sports and news networks. He checked the local news to see whether the day had declared Mark alive, but there was no mention of the case today. Mark assumed that the politician was still figuring out how to spin the fact that Mark had duped them all without making the DEA look foolish. He browsed the guide for a show to watch and decided on an old replay of The Fugitive. He assumed he'd get an idea of what to do. Since the drama was about a convicted killer who went from place to place, trying to clear his name while also avoiding capture. If he did the same, he would still have the majority of the $10,000 in cash with him. Unlike in the 1960s, when the episode initially aired, he would have internet access, credit cards, and, because he banked with a huge national bank, he would be able to access his money from anywhere. He would be able to contact his attorney from any place. The same goes with Kelly. She could reach him at any time. She was a good businesswoman, and he could rely on her to keep the enterprise operating. Any new contracts could be handled via FedEx if necessary, and he could fly in, meet with a prospective customer, and then fly out without the cops knowing. In the morning, he got online and began planning his lengthy trip. 
He chose the East Coast, first and foremost. That was where most of the country's history was concentrated. He'd always wanted to visit Boston, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., and he could easily spend a month just at the Smithsonian. By the afternoon, he was prepared to depart. He offered his rod and reel to a child who had been hanging out on the pier. The urchin appeared forlorn and hungry, and he claimed to enjoy fishing but could not afford the necessary equipment. Mark gave him everything he had. The child was ecstatic. Mark then went to buy a bus ticket. He planned to take the bus to the next city, having an international airport. From there, he could fly anywhere. Mark spent the following year traveling. He'd stay a week or more in a city, growing tired of motels and hotels. He eventually bought a large RV, a Class A type, and utilized it as his mobile home. He'd drive to a new city, find a suitable RV park, rent a car, and then go exploring. He toured museums and parks. He attended all types of ball games. Professional college or even high school made no difference to him. He occasionally went to a bar or pub and got to know some of the regulars. He never drank excessively, but he was always prepared to stand about if needed. He occasionally associated with a local lass. He was quite nervous around married women. He didn't want to treat another poor slob the way Dale had treated him. He would only spend one, two, or three nights with a woman before moving on. He had no intention of pursuing a long-term relationship until some issues at home were resolved. Willa considered the divorce. She demanded counseling. Mark's lawyer agreed, but since no one knew where Mark was, the judge decided against it. She sought the lion's share of the firm, citing their losses. She was extremely focused on getting it off the ground. Mark's counsel replied that Mark had structured the corporation such that Willa could only sell her share and not demand the sale of the business. He presented the official documentation that established the corporation with her signature in the appropriate area and her initials on the other pages. The judge ordered the corporation to ensure that Willa receives her part of the profits on a quarterly basis. It would allow her to maintain a comfortable but not luxurious lifestyle. Mark gave Willa both the house and the cars. He actually handed her everything in the house. She also possessed a sizable gun collection and antiques that she had accumulated over time. The package's value was enormous. Willa also inherited Dell's job at Timmins Electronics. When his accounting techniques were revealed, Dale vanished into the unknown. The SEC was hunting for him on other grounds. With Dale gone, there was no one at the helm. So Willa stepped in and took over as helmsman, bringing the company back from the brink of bankruptcy. The board of directors fully supported her. She was compensated nicely. She was compensated so handsomely that she didn't have to demolish Mark's business to keep her lifestyle. Mark learnt via his attorney that Willa simply wanted a sit-down meeting where she could make her case to him. Mark eventually agreed. He arrived in town as he had left it on the bus. He had parked the RV 100 miles away in a national forest and then taken a taxi to the bus station. After the bus ride, he took a taxi to the enormous hotel where he would see his estranged wife. He arrived early enough to look around and see whether anyone was watching. He wasn't really concerned about the cops anymore, but he wasn't taking any chances. He was aware that certain charges were still pending against him, but the original district attorney was failed in his re-election attempt, and the new DA was immersed in gang and drug activity, culminating in a nightclub shooting that killed eight people. The poor man and his team worked many late hours attempting to bring the gunman to justice. Mark was insignificant and had been an embarrassment to the previous administration, not the present one. Mark entered the hotel, greeted his attorney, and went to the small meeting room that had been reserved for them. Willa and her attorney eventually joined them. Introductions were made and everyone was quickly seated, with a beverage of their choice in front of them. Mark reclined back and crossed his legs, sipping his enormous mug of coffee and thinking about his wife. Willa appeared to be in decent shape, if little older and weathered. He assumed that the demands of the new job were taking a toll on her. William sat and took in the man she had been married to for so long, but now seemed like a stranger. He was thinner, yet appeared to be in form. He had a well-groomed goatee and lengthy but well-kept hair. His attire was unlike the suit and tie he was used to wearing. No, it was just clean khakis and a decent button-down shirt. Finally, Mark ended the stillness. You called this meeting? Why don't you start speaking? Willa made quick eye contact with her attorney as he gave a tiny nod. 
She cleared her throat and started. Mark, first and foremost, I apologize for hurting you. That wasn't my aim. Dale and I started seeing each other outside the office. There was no fault on your part. I guess we simply started working together later on, and then we just started relaxing and eating late together. It progressed from one thing to another until we were in bed together. He was not bigger than you, or better in bed, just different. As Willis began to speak, Mark took out a small tablet and began to mark the page. He went on as long as she talked. She said, I still love you and want to marry you. I think we can get through this. I've sought counseling, and I believe we can have a stronger marriage than we had previously. I now understand that cheating damages everyone. You are free to return to your home immediately. I haven't changed anything. All of your belongings are there. We'll be happy. Simply wait and see. Mark kept marking his paper. Finally, he was finished. Yep, it was just what I expected. You hit the most of the justifications straight out of the cheater's handbook. The only thing you didn't try was anything ancient. It's not you, it's me. And the one that leaves. You never lacked love. I just have a question about the children we had planned to have. We're a full year older than when I last asked you. He gave her the paper on which he had put down several justifications and excuses for cheating after reading stories online. He had a mark for almost every excuse on the page. Willa blanched slightly. She was used to negotiating contracts and was typically ahead, often by a large margin. Why? Last week, she struck a great bargain with Kelly Parsons for warehouse space that was ideal for Timmons Electronics. I just thought we were growing too old to have kids. Besides, my job is demanding. It is a full-time, 60 to 80 hour per week work that needs a significant amount of my time. We are attempting to avoid closing the company. I don't have time for that. Her voice trailed off as she realized her honest response was not what Mark was looking for. We've reached an impasse, Willa. I've discovered that I can keep a connection to our company by hiring great talent to perform day-to-day -day tasks and just being available to handle crises and contracts. I've given Kelly a lot of latitude and even contracts, so I only need to be available for new huge contracts. You've determined that Timmons Electronics can't function without you every minute of the day. I'm really not sure why you think I should return. I'd see you less than if you were screwing Dale. And I guarantee the sex would be much less than before. Mark stood. He recognized when a negotiation was finished. Why don't you find another stud to screw into your office? That is all you need. He departed without waiting for an answer and began walking to the bus depot. Mark was shocked Willa didn't try to stop him, given her strong feelings for him. He didn't squander time by simply strolling towards his future. No, his stride was broad and his strides were rapid. His plan was to phone his attorney when he got on the bus and have him handle the divorce. He was content with being single. Once he was completely free, he could settle anywhere and then look for a woman who would match his lifestyle. He scarcely saw the police cruiser parked at the depot as he entered the small waiting room and went to buy his ticket. Excuse me, sir, but it appears that Mark Wallace has approached him from behind. Mark turned and responded to the patrolman. Yes, I'm Mark Wallace. Is anything wrong, sir? You have been arrested for false reporting and conspiracy to bring false accusations against Willa Wallace and Dale Timmons. Please place your hands on top of your head and turn to face the wall, sir. Mark complied. He did not believe the new district attorney would be looking for him. Willa must have contacted the cops as he exited the conference. Soon, he was handcuffed and patted down. After then, he was taken to the police station and booked. Then he was placed in a holding cell to await transit to the jail. Nobody bothered to talk to him or ask him a question in the jail. He was photographed and fingerprinted before being sent to a holding cell to await the arrival of his counsel. He was not forced to wear the orange jumpsuit because the deputy chaperoning him informed him that he would only have to make bail and then be released. His attorney appeared and told Mark that he had previously spoken with the assistant district attorney. He was offering a plea deal that would keep Mark out of jail and require a minimum of probation. He believed it would be accepted and Mark would be out of trouble without any difficulty. Mark agreed with the plan. Mark was then brought in front of the judge. Since this was only a bond hearing, the judge asked a few questions. The key question was whether Mark posed a flight risk. Mark candidly said that he was practically homeless because his RV served as his abode, which most people did not regard to be a house. 
He pledged to have the RV transported to a campground in town so that he wouldn't break the terms of the bond. Suddenly, another attorney approached the bench. If I may speak, I represent Mark's wife, Willow Wallace. He has a residence in the city, and she is willing to cover the entire cost of bail and guarantees the court that he will not skip. In fact, she is demanding that he be placed under house arrest with an ankle monitoring device to help the court determine his desire to comply with the terms of the bond. Mark scowled at his lawyer. He would never consent to be confined in the same house as Willa. He felt Willa was enraged at him and wanted retribution for the public humiliation he had inflicted on her. Being ankle-watched where she could reach him was not in his best interests. The judge was considering his attorney's motion. Mark nudged his attorney and whispered to him. The attorney nodded. My client is grateful for his wife's offer of residence and bail, but he believes it is not in his best interests. Your honor may not recall the events proceeding up to today, but my client believes that this arrangement is a ruse by his estranged wife to get revenge against him for the embarrassment he gave her when he had an affair with her boss, public. My client sincerely requests that alternative arrangements be made for his bail. He is willing to give his passport and be monitored electronically, but not at his former address or with his estranged wife there. Your client is willing to face incarceration if I disagree with him. Yes, sir. My client is willing to be placed in the general population of the jail and then request a swift trial at the court's earliest convenience. I see. I suppose I will adjourn this court for a little break. Could the appropriate attorneys please join me in chambers? With that, the judge lowered his gavel and brought the prosecutor forward. Mark's attorney and Will are escorted to his chambers behind the bench. They were gone for about fifteen minutes. Mark was forced to wait there bored and uncomfortable because the bailiff was constantly eyeing him. Finally, the attorneys returned, and his attorney appeared dissatisfied. Mark drew heart from that. Mark's attorney escorted him outside to a quiet location to discuss. The bailiff accompanied them, but did not handcuff Mark. When they were alone, Mark's lawyer spoke. Mark, the judge is sympathetic. He truly laughed when he remembered how you punked your wife and her partner. The prosecutor also wants things resolved fast and quietly. Other pressing occurrences are distracting him. He does not want this to go to trial. Would you be willing to plead guilty if the judge suspended your sentence and granted you probation? Mark sat and thought about it. He was guilty, and he knew he may face jail time if convicted. He nodded in agreement, and they returned to the courtroom. His counsel briefly spoke with the prosecutor before the judge called the proceedings back to order. Mark stood and pleaded guilty to filing a fraudulent police complaint. Mark was sentenced to a $1,000 fine and a year of probation. With that, Mark was free. Mark was processed out of jail and phoned Kelly Parsons. Kelly, I'll be in town for a year completing my probation. Please make preparations to bring my RV here. Also, do we have any accommodations available? Mark, I've decided to use last year's income to buy an expensive small apartment building. We rent out four of the flats and reserve the remaining two for visiting clients. Both are two-bedroom homes that come fully furnished. You simply need to choose which one you want, and I will make all the preparations. Mark praised his CO, and his attorney drove him to the three-story apartment building. He chose the one that best suited him. It was on the third level, and very big. It was also outfitted with high-quality furniture. After Kelly called back to confirm which one he was taking— a delivery person arrived with food staples and a case of beer. Later that afternoon, his RV was delivered by two of his employees who had offered to recover his pride and pleasure. Mark also arranged for a car delivery so he could get around town more easily. He moved some clothes and his computer from the RV to the condo and was quickly settled. He had a quiet evening in his new house before heading to work the next morning. It had been months since he had walked through the doors of his company, so he was thrilled to see the modernization and renovations Kelly had completed since he had departed on his vacation. His previous colleagues came to say hello, and he was introduced to new ones. When they were first launched, the majority were extremely quiet. Kelly smiled and informed Mark that all employees had heard about the incident at the Wallace home, and the new employees were well aware of how Mark had set up and disciplined Wilson Dale in the office. The gloves were removed, so to speak, Kelly started out. What are your plans for the company? Are you returning to run the place? 
If so, where does this leave me? Mark smiled and replied, Kelly, you did an excellent job. Probably better than I. The company was performing well and even expanding. I understand you have a couple more large firms looking to us for buildings to house enormous inventories and possibly a new distribution center. I'd want to run you through a few suggestions for taking us to the next level. I am not sure I want to take back control. I've loved my hands-off approach to the company, and I believe you'll make solid judgments to keep us prosperous. In fact, I need to talk to you about how we can keep you here. Would a portion of the corporation help you understand how essential you are to me? Kelly smiled at her employer. She was convinced that he would not abandon her, but the promise of a portion of the company was a good incentive to stay and work as a team. They discussed options, including Mark's suggestion to grow the company to new places and try to replicate their success. They devised a timeline for acquiring unoccupied or blighted properties and beginning the expansion process. Mark insisted that Kelly stay in control, and he would assist in finding new clients once the warehouses were operational in their next target city. Kelly, however, added fuel to the flames. Mark, I want to be your CEO or CEO, whichever you like, but I also want to take some time off to start my family. My husband and I have been waiting for the perfect time to have a baby, and I am thrilled to share that I am six weeks pregnant. Would you be willing to take back control of the company until I am ready to resume? Mark wasn't sure he wanted to be so involved with the business again, but Kelly was a Jim who couldn't be replaced, so he swallowed his fears and smiled his brightest. Of course, that is fine with me. I'll keep your seat warm for as long as you need to get this new Parsons youngster up and running. Kelly offered him a hug. How would you like to be his or her godfather? To say Mark was humbled by the request would be an understatement. He was speechless for a few minutes before bursting into a grin and saying a big yes to her. He grabbed her and gave her a strong hug, wishing her a happy mothering experience. Over the next few weeks, Mark was briefed on the present state of the firm and Kelly's plans for local expansion. He wholeheartedly approved of them all. Willow, as a co-owner, had to be informed of all plans, and she had no serious reservations about any of them. Willow attempted several times and utilized various, sometimes unusual, methods to persuade Mark to sit down and try to save their marriage. She failed each time. Instead, she convinced the judge to impose counseling. Mark couldn't fight that one unless he risked jail time for contempt, which would jeopardize his probation. Mark had no choice in the counselor, therefore he thought Willard's pick would be entirely consistent with Willow's goals and desires, regardless of his own. He was pleasantly surprised to meet with Dr. Marsha McClellan privately. She merely stated that she had already met with Willa and that it had been a productive discussion, but she was unable to share anything they had talked. Likewise, she refused to discuss anything Mark had given her in private. She then inquired further about how the pair had met, Mark's own childhood, education, and personal experiences, as well as what made him tick. Finally, she inquired about the circumstances leading up to the breakup. She made no mention of the party's publicity or Willa and Dell's relationship, which was made public at the end of the session. Mark felt he had a neutral person in the counselor rather than the antagonist he had imagined. She never interrupted except to ask for clarification. When Mark was detailing how he had set up Willa, he never felt like she was judging him. She did question why he had not permitted the couple to stand trial. Mark was honest when he informed her that he despised what Willa had done to their relationship, but he couldn't in good conscience allow her to be convicted and imprisoned when she was innocent of the charges. I'm sorry that the frame-up I pulled on her destroyed her relationships with her family and friends. That was not something I had anticipated. I just wanted to punish her for what she had done to us, and more specifically, myself. By the end of the workout, Mark was exhausted. He left her office, despite the fact that it was still early in the day, and returned to his condo to enjoy a couple of fingers of his favorite bourbon before relaxing for the remainder of the day. Between these talks, he sent out personnel to look for properties in other cities for the anticipated expansion. He couldn't leave the city due to his probationary period, so he had to delegate. It benefited him and his employees. Mark was learning to trust his team, and they were gaining in their experience. Their first encounter as a pair was tense. Willa preferred to sit close to Mark, but he chose a seat where he could view both Dr. McClellan and Willa without turning his head. 
he needed to observe their body language as well as listen closely to Willa. Dr. McClellan began by asking each person to describe their initial meeting and early relationship experiences. This started them off by recalling the good times. She successfully inquired about the moment they both acknowledged their love for each other and the subsequent evolution of their partnership. She inquired about the specifics of their wedding ceremony, as well as how they felt about every great and negative aspect of it. She had discovered throughout her professional career that many long-term troubles in marriages began with the hype of the perfect ceremony. Men typically preferred a simple ceremony to commemorate their love for their wives, whereas the average woman utilized the wedding to create a Mia atmosphere in which the groom was virtually an afterthought. She was pleased to inform the couple that there did not appear to be much personality clash during their marriage celebration. This had taken up a significant portion of the first session. Dr. McClellan closed the session by assigning Mark and Willa to list their marriage's disappointments. Starting at the time, everyone thought that it was becoming stale. As they were leaving, Wheeler tried again to get Mark to accompany her home, but Mark simply walked away to his car. For his own peace of mind, he had to lose Willa, who was following him. He didn't want her to know where he lived. At their next session, Mark began the topic about their marriage and when it went stale by citing Willa's lack of contact during late nights at work, followed by a lack of any display of affection, such as kissing, hugging, pillow talk, and sex. Mark claimed that this had been going on for months before he finally had Willa checked. Willa had a very different perspective on their marriage before the blood trick. She believed they were still a loving relationship, and that having sex with Dale was not a threat to her marriage, or an indicator of her feelings for Mark. Mark had anticipated her response, as she appeared to believe that he should forgive and forget all of the slights she had given him. He took out a portable DVD player and hit the play button. It was based on one of Willa's post-sex chats with Dale. My baby. That was good. You take care of me better than Mark ever could. Dale responded, and Willa continued. I'm not sure why I married him. I almost filed for divorce when he quit working for you and launched the warehouse business because there had been no money for a long time. My job with you kept us financially stable for a long time. I should just dump him so I can be ready and available to you more frequently, Dale then countered. Have you cut him off from sex, as I asked? I definitely do not want anything from your chicken hubby, sweetheart. I keep myself pure for you. Mark paused the replay and turned to face Willa. She had a horrified expression on her face and shook her head in denial. You mouthed the words, but I knew better. You profess to love me, but I don't understand why you think of me that way, and yet want me to return to your place. I can only assume you intend to humiliate me in retaliation for outing you and your sex companion, Dale. He turned to face Dr. McClellan. I'm sorry, doctor, but I don't see any longer need for your services. Willa lives in a dream world where she never makes a mistake, and I should be grateful for the few tidbits she throws at me. She believes that I should not need a loving wife and instead serve as her doormat. Marsha McClellan regrettably accepted his conclusion. There would be no progress unless Willa made significant concessions. I agree with you, Mark. I'll ask to continue individual sessions with you both because I believe you both require assistance and healing. Mark nodded to Willa and Dr. McClellan before leaving the office. He felt the urge to return to work and consult with his colleagues about the expansion locations. Willa followed him into the warehouse. She still wanted to speak. Mark shook his shoulders in defeat and took her to the tiny training room where they could enjoy some privacy while not having to sit too close together. Few of the employees even knew who Willa was, so the rumor began as Mark closed the door for privacy. Nobody would bother them unless he opened the door again. This is it, Willa. This is the final meeting. Speak your piece, then leave and let me to get back to work. Willa gazed at his hard, unbending expression. She had seen her husband when he was joyful, satisfied after sex, tired and stressed, and angered at how events combined to stymie their plans throughout the years. And how sad. She acted almost like a spanked puppy when she refused to talk about children. But she'd never seen this look before. He appeared to be made entirely of rock and was equally unfeeling. She took a deep breath and attempted to restore their marriage, despite knowing deep down that it was a hopeless cause. I'm sorry you had to hear those comments. I never meant for you to hear any of those talks. 
I certainly did not feel that way about you or our marriage. Each and every one of those statements was intended to boost Dale's ego. He insisted on it early on in our affair. He had to take charge of our life. He insisted on cutting you off from sex with me. He suggested that I deter you from having sex with me by being indifferent to you and your advances. At the time, I saw it as a trick to play on you. I hate to confess it, but we laughed more than once at how excited you must have been if it was feasible. Mark's expression got even more implacable. Willa couldn't see how her insults were affecting him and hurting his ego. The only thing keeping him from revealing how much she, once the love of his life, was damaging him was the fact that numerous women had sought his company while he traveled around the country over the last year. No lover has expressed unhappiness with his abilities as a lover. In truth, Mark was responsible for ending each relationship. She paused to sob in sorrow, realizing how much she was hurting him, but she had to keep on. She burst into tears for a few minutes while trying to tell him what happened later that evening. You know, the night of the surprise birthday celebration? Dale, please let me know what you have planned. We chuckled at how naive you must be to beg him to keep me away till the appropriate time. We had sex on his office couch a few times. She paused as she absorbed his disgusted expression. She wasn't sure whether it was a better expression than the stony one. He then returned with a nod, expressing his unsaid judgment of Dale's plans. She proceeded. Yes, I agree that it looked like a charming trick to play on you at the time, but in retrospect, it was a humiliating and terrible thing to do to someone I claimed to love. She waited for a deep breath. She went added, when we got to the house, we were laughing and joking about how we had pulled the wool over your eyes. I was quite pleased. I was having wonderful sex on the side, and you were throwing me a birthday party. I was wondering what expensive gift you were going to give me when we got out of the pickup. I didn't even consider why so many people were standing outside the house. I was so confident in myself that I didn't even consider why no one seemed to be hiding. She let out a sob. Then we went up to the crowd and learned about the blood. There was a lot of discussion regarding what had occurred. Everyone seemed to know only one thing. You were missing and there was a lot of blood. Willis shakes her head. I was in denial for a while. We spoke with some of the people. Initially, they expressed their best wishes for my birthday. But as the gossip worsened, people began to move away from us and whisper among themselves. Finally, someone asked what we had done with your body. She broke down again for a few moments. That's when I became quite concerned. More cops started arriving. Some folks were departing. After being pointed out, one of the cops approached us and began to interview us. When I asked about you, he couldn't or wouldn't say anything. He merely kept asking where we'd gone earlier that evening. We couldn't say we were screwing in an empty office, but that's exactly what we were doing. While you were being attacked and kidnapped, I began to feel ill. She gulped a little. I believe you knew precisely how you wanted me to feel, and I did. My husband, the one I stood in front of and told the world I would love and cherish forever, is gone and presumed gravely injured, if not dead. While playing the 304, I had sex with my boss. Then a detective arrived and took us into custody, transporting us to the police station for questioning. That's how I found out you knew about Dale and me. They discovered the packet of information in the desk. The investigator insisted that I listen to each audio and view every second of each video demonstrating how terribly I treated you. Willa broke down again. When she regained her calm, she stated, I was so distraught here. I thought you had been murdered and they were accusing me of killing you and concealing your body. They continued asking Dale if he needed money. They handed me a new insurance policy that I allegedly took out on you. I was so stunned by the claim that I couldn't think clearly. Finally, I requested for a lawyer so that they would stop harassing me. We paused for a bit and Mark brought her a drink of water. She thanked him and started to speculate about what had happened to you. I began to wonder if Dale had something to do with your absence. They came in and showed me plastic and duct tape from his pickup that had blood stains on it. They inquired about the state of R and Dale's businesses. I knew where Dale was when you were allegedly attacked, but I had to wonder if he hadn't planned to get rid of you and hired someone to kill you. He would have greatly benefited from such insurance policy. Later, I discovered that she pinned him with a despairing expression. For the next week, I was in hell. My husband, the man I actually loved, was thought to have died. I was in mourning, but I did not have any family support. 
My family believed the rumors that I was involved in your disappearance. I couldn't leave, but I also couldn't stay at home. When I entered the bedroom, all I could see was blood. All this blood. And it was yours. The laboratory confirmed it. Where did you obtain all this blood? The police returned and wanted information about the rat poison. I had no idea we had any poison in the house, yet they only found my fingerprints on the packaging. I was going insane. I knew I didn't mean you any harm, but I wasn't sure whether my girlfriend felt the same way. Dale, like myself, was losing weight due to a lack of sleep and appetite. But, and there's a major but, we weren't speaking to each other anymore. I'd only speak with him at work if absolutely essential. Gretchen had kicked him out of the house and was planning to file for divorce. Customers began leaving and canceling orders, first locally and then nationally. The district attorney then went on television and announced that he was heading to the grand jury to seek an indictment. Nobody had even proposed proclaiming you dead, and I was in danger of being prosecuted for your murder. She broke down and cried again. Did you detest me so much that you intended to destroy me? At that time, she appeared so lonely and sad that Mark deeply regretted his actions. She looked down at her hands on the table. You succeeded. Is there no one at work? No one in my family. Certainly no one in your family would talk to me. Everyone ostracized me. I'd stop by the house to collect some clothes and find graffiti on the door. It was always in the same vein. Specifically, that I was a murderous witch who should die. The phone call began. I changed my number several times. I believe someone at the phone store was handing out my new number every time as the calls would halt for a brief period of time before restarting. The worst ones were those who used your number and whispered, How could you kill me, Willa? How could you do that to me? I became hysterical at times. I'd call Kelly and she'd attempt to console me, but I knew she despised me too. She was your employee and friend, not mine. She shivered and took a big breath. Then you came out of hiding to call me. I was ecstatic and can't wait to see you again. I wanted you to go home safely. I wanted to kiss, hug, rage at you, cry, laugh, and scream, sit calmly, staring at you, beg for your pardon while accusing you of scaring me. I wanted it all at the same moment. But no, you simply informed me that you were alive before disappearing again. Kelly wouldn't tell me where you were. There were rumors again. Some claimed you were actually dead and that I was fabricating your presence to divert attention away from what we had done. She paused and gave Mark an annoyed look. I know you've sneaked into town on occasion. I presume it was to do some business at the warehouse. But you never phoned me. You never visited the house. You made no attempt to contact us at all. Fortunately, you did provide me access to some monies so that I could keep up with my house payments. Then Dale left town. Timmons Electronics has nearly closed. I had to take up the reins to try to reclaim it. And I've been successful thus far. Mark considered his final ideas. You eventually come back and insist that I agree to have children. I'm too busy keeping Timmons open to attempt to get pregnant. What kind of life will our child have if I'm too busy running a business, working 16, 18 hours per day? Please tell me how I can raise a family with such a demanding schedule. 100 workers rely on my competence to do the job. Their family have demanded that I perform my job. Our customers expect that I give up my personal life. She was enthused. Mark would credit her for it. She finally started to unwind. I just want my hubby and our marriage back. Is this too much to ask for? Can't you forgive me and allow us to love one another again? She extended her hands to Mark, but he did not respond at all. He didn't back away. But he didn't try to meet her in the middle of the table either. There was no touch at all. Is this my turn to speak? Mark maintained his fury and nodded. She could see that his face remained stone rigid. His lips didn't even move while he talked. She was unconvinced by his smooth speech. You claim you want our marriage restored and me back in our home, but what exactly do you want? Do you want the marriage where we talk about our future and the family we'll have? Or the marriage from a year ago, when you just came home to sleep after seducing your boss all day? Mark held up his hand to silence her response. No, no, I have yet to speak. I let you to unload on me. Now it's your turn to listen. Willa shrank back. Mark added, You say you want to marry me, but you also say you have to work 16 to 18 hours a day to keep Timmons Electronics open and to keep the employees, their families, and the customers happy. Where would you find time for a husband? 
I presume you get some sleep? Willa nodded. Mark continued on in the same way. What type of life does that place me in as your husband? What should I do? Am I meant to sit around and wait like a lost puppy for a pat on the head and a bite to eat? I do not think so. I'm eager to assist in any manner possible, but I refuse to be the second fiddle in a relationship. I couldn't care less about Timmons Electronics. If it requires your undivided attention for 16 or 18 hours every day, it may need to fail. Dale certainly did not devote that much of his life to it, despite the fact that it was his creation and main responsibility. He always found time to make his wife feel cherished while banging you every day. Why do you have vice presidents? Don't they perform any heavy lifting? I believe you should assess all management positions and eliminate the deadwood. He stood. Finally, I'd like some pillow conversation. The quiet, simple time to communicate with my partner. I want to be able to sit down with my wife and discuss everything from the smallest details to global issues. I want to be able to express my love for her through thinking, action, and words. Even if I never have a child. I want a life outside of work. I want to be able to take a vacation without being shackled to my work or having my wife chained to hers. I want a wife, not a roommate. I refuse to accept for second place in a relationship. Mark opened the door. I presume you get aroused once in a while. You appear to want sex with Dale, if not with me anymore. So why not hire a man? He might plan to screw you whenever you want. Your life will be considerably simpler if you get a dog to share your bed. If you need someone to keep you warm, a dog is much more forgiving than I am. Will, I just sat there while Mark left the room. She was now absolutely distraught. She only had Timmons Electronics to call her family. What if Mark is correct? Overall, her efforts to keep the doors open were a hollow victory. Would anyone care if she gave up her health and family for a corporation? Did Timmons Electronics offer any unique electronic equipment that could not be obtained elsewhere? Willa felt older than her 38 years. She got up from the table and walked out the door. There was no one in her way who knew about the business she and her husband did not own. That was another of Mark's disputes about family. He or she was a co-owner in a thriving corporation, and she only knew the other owner and the CEO. This was a sobering concept. Was she placing too much attention and emphasis on a corporation in which she had no ownership? Willa made a mental note to look into the availability of a rescue dog. Her house was extremely empty without Mark. She needed to make it feel more like home. With a dog in need of care, she might even look forward to returning home. In the days after the meeting and clearing the air, Willa gave up attempting to bring Mark back, and their respective lawyers met together and worked out a compromise. At the end of the day, Willa would sell her half of Wallace Warehouses for a predetermined amount. This allowed Mark to give Kelly Parsons 10% of the business. Mark oversaw the day-to-day -day operations while Kelly was pregnant and giving birth. Kelly was absent from the office for the entire 12-week period following the birth of her child. Her infant boy, James Mark Parsons, named after her husband and boss, delighted everyone. Mark accepted his status as godfather despite Willa being named the boy's godmother. Willa was happy with her new godson. Did she regret not having her own? Nobody will ever know, but she agreed to be any following infants or babies, godmother or even appointed aunt. Over time, she realized that she needed to recruit the right people and outsource some of her responsibilities in order to have some time for herself. She rarely dated, but had a male toy or two to satisfy her sexual cravings. After Kelly returned to work and Mark successfully finished his probationary period, he returned to the road. His RV covered a lot of ground as he visited various locales as a tourist and as potential growth locations for his warehouses. On occasion, he would meet a nice woman who would share his body for a night or two, but he was not looking for a new sweetheart. First, he learned to be alone without feeling lonely. He discovered that he could be happy and fulfilled without relying on others. This takes the edge off of any new relationship. He could relax and let a potential love connection to develop without tension. A few years passed. His business was expanding. There were periodic travels back home to conduct face-to-face -face meetings with Kelly and the other CEOs. This allowed him to keep his finger on the company's pulse while simultaneously reminding each of his staff who the actual owner was. Mark worked hard to ensure that no one thought it was going to be a stressful reunion, but rather that it was simply a means to stay informed of changes and potential expansion prospects. 
Mark would also spend this time getting to know his godson and goddaughter. Yes, Kelly had decided to expand her family rather than raise James as an only child. Each pregnancy brought Mark back to the helm while Kelly was away. Mark took the kids camping to the local amusement park, taught them how to play baseball, watched their soccer games, wondered what the fuss was about, and attended numerous cookouts. He had to be nice to Willa when she attended a function, and it wasn't difficult to do so. Did Mark ever married and have his own children? Because this is not his full life story, the answer might be yes or no. He had no regrets about outing his wife and her lover. It was a fantastic ploy that was quite effective in breaking any relationship they could have been establishing. Overall, it was a good bloody trick.